you know, allow people to kind of roll in um, as we go. Um, welcome everyone again to kind of our last installment. This is the last week uh, today and Thursday of our in-service Empire Urology Prep. Um, we're very fortunate, Dr. Najari. And am I, am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, Najari. <laughs> um, Dr. Najari uh, did most of his training just right across the park from where I train at Columbia at Cornell Residency Fellowship. Uh, now is at NYU, um, an assistant professor there, associate director of the residency program, I believe, and um, uh, director of the male infertility uh, program there. So we're very fortunate to kind of take a, a leap into evaluating uh, male infertility um, and all the, the stuff that comes along with that. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Najari, very much for being a part of this. And I'll, I'll pass the mic over to you. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks so much for <clears throat> for having me. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay. Great. So um, so we're going to go over male infertility, and obviously it's a it's a large topic. Um, I can't go over uh, everything. Besides uh, the uh, AUA uh, best practice documents, um, a lot of the same authors uh, are also on the um, committee that comes out with these guidelines from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And so um, these are actually much more up to date. Uh, and so uh, I think these are relatively short documents that are just very high yield uh, to review if you're going to read something uh, before, um, you know, before the exam. So um, throughout the talk, I'll um, we'll go through cases um, drawn from SASP and, um, and I'll just kind of go over some sort of a framework of how to think of infertility questions. So um, broadly speaking, you want to be thinking about um, whether or not that patient has a pre-testicular uh, cause for their fertility, some abnormality in their hypothalamus or pituitary gland, like uh, microadenoma or uh, Kalman syndrome? Do they have a testicular problem, uh, like a varicocele contributing uh, to their infertility or uh, Klinefelter syndrome? Uh, or do they have a post-testicular problem, um, like uh, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens or ejaculatory duct obstruction? So, um, so that's sort of high level, you know, what uh, what what is their etiology? So, jumping right into a case, uh, twenty-six year old infertile man with an ejaculate volume of zero point nine milliliters. So, um, so be somewhat familiar with um, the uh, volume threshold, the uh, concentration or count threshold, and the motility thresholds for when they are abnormal and, and normal. So, a volume of zero point nine milliliters is low, uh, sperm count of 10 million per milliliters is low, and same thing with uh, motility of 20%, that's low. Um, physical exam is normal, and so that tells you um, the uh, vas deferens are present. Um, hormonal evaluation is also normal. So next step, antibody testing, um, that's uh, reasonable thought given low motility, but I don't know that that's the best next step. Um, if you have anti-sperm antibodies in the semen that can cause low motility. Semen culture, um, if there was leukocytosis in the semen, uh, that might be reasonable. Uh, Post-ejaculatory urine analysis and Transrectal ultrasound. I think those are um, those are good guesses for a low volume uh, semen analysis, and then a scrotal ultrasound. Pretty much always, a scrotal ultrasound is uh, the wrong answer on these exams. Almost always, um, the they mention that the physical exam is normal, so there's really no indication for it outside of a physical exam, that's difficult. So um, when thinking of low volume, uh, 
be mindful of the anatomic contributions to semen. So most of that is coming from the seminal vesicles. Uh, some of it is coming from the prostate and only a small proportion is coming from the testis. And that's why after you do a vasectomy, people don't really notice any changes in their semen volume or sexual function. And so when someone has, um, has low volume semen, you're thinking something perhaps up in the, in the pelvis. Um, clues as to whether or not someone has uh, some kind of obstruction uh, versus uh, say retrograde ejaculation could be um, the pH of the, of the semen because again, the seminal vesicles contribute the majority of the volume. And so that's why uh, the pH of semen is basic. Uh, if there is an ejaculatory duct obstruction, uh, so here, right, the ejaculatory duct, um, you're gonna see acidic semen because um, the prostate's contribution to semen is acidic. Um, one sort of mnemonic for that is just, we used to use prostatic acid phosphatase uh, as, a, as a marker for prostate cancer. Um, so causes for low ejaculate volume are a uh, very low testosterone level. Um, so I'm not talking like 280, at least sort of like borderline uh, low testosterone levels, but um, something pretty drastically low like you would see in Kleinfeld or uh, in Kleinfeld or, or Kalman syndrome. Um, retrograde ejaculation, either due to uh, late stage diabetes or a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, uh, ejaculatory duct obstruction, either from a, a cyst or, uh, or just scarring after some kind of prostatitis, um, or congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. And um, regarding congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens, I'm gonna go back to the slide. So, um, you know, so let's say someone's missing their vas deferens, like you do, a, you do an exam, you feel that they have an epididymis and um, they have a vas deferens up to about the mid scrotum. So they have that on both sides. So you diagnose them with congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. Why would they have um, low volume semen? Well, it's because um, you can think, uh, think of the abnormalities with congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens kind of following the path that sperm follows. So, you know, sperm leave the testicle at the head of the epididymis, uh, they travel down through the tail and then up the vas deferens where they meet up with the seminal vesicle to form the ejaculatory duct obstruction. So in congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens, if uh, you, you can have, um, someone who just has the head of the epididymis and lacks the body and tail. Uh, and, and basically, if, they, if that uh, abnormality starts at the body of the epididymis, they're going to not only lack the body and, and tail of the epididymis, they're gonna lack all of their vas deferens. And importantly, they're going to um, lack the seminal vesicle on uh, either that side or both sides if it's bilateral. And, so again, because the seminal vesicles contribute uh, most of the volume of semen, um, that's why men with congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens will have low volume semen. So uh, even if they have the full epididymis and they've got a vas deferens that ends mid scrotum, they're gonna lack the pelvic portion of the vas deferens and seminal vesicles. So that's why um, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens is one of the causes of low ejaculate volume. Um, in terms of testing, so, um, so you have someone who has low ejaculate volume, what can you do to test for these different uh, etiologies? Well, testosterone, you can just check a serum testosterone in the morning. Uh, retrograde ejaculation, you can do a post-ejaculate urine analysis. 
Ejaculatory duct obstruction is a little bit difficult to diagnose, but for exam purposes, if on a truss, their seminal vesicle diameter is greater than 1.5 centimeters, that would be suggestive of ejaculatory duct obstruction. Or um, you can also aspirate the seminal vesicle and see if there is um, sperm kind of uh, back flowing into the seminal vesicle. And then for um, CBAVD, that is just diagnosed on a physical exam. Uh, so back to the question, 26-year-old um, guy, low volume, low count, low motility. Uh, so again, the first thing you want to figure out is low volume. Um, what, it, what is the next step? Like I said, post-ejaculatory urine analysis seems reasonable. So does uh, truss and um, post-ejaculatory urine analysis is less invasive. And again, one of the themes with the test is generally you want to go with the less invasive test first. So, so that's the correct answer here. Um, so yeah, so one of the uh, rules for evaluation is just first look at the volume. Is it less than uh, like 1.5 is the, the newest um, reference range? Um, I think most of the questions, if it's if they're trying to highlight that it's a low volume patient, it'll be less than one milliliter. Um, so that's the that's uh, the first rule. Um, so this next question: So, 35 year old man with azospermia, normal genetic testing, desires a kid. Uh, testosterone is slightly low, 275. Um, you could consider 300 to be a good reference range. Uh, for what's normal versus low. Um, LH is 28, FSH is 15. Those are both high. Uh, normally you'd like them to be say less than six to seven. Both testes are three centimeters in length and soft. Uh, the next step is a clomiphene citrate uh, to try to raise LH and FSH. Um, HCG, which mimics LH, scrotal ultrasound. Um, I don't know why that would be the answer. Uh, MRI to evaluate the pituitary gland or a micro -tessie. Um, So uh, a lot of these questions are going to uh, test your understanding of the HPG axis. So just as a brief reminder, GnRH made by the hypothalamus acts on the anterior pituitary gland, which makes follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. FSH acts on the Sertoli cells to support spermatogenesis. And um, the Sertoli cells also create inhibin, which provides negative feedback to both the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Uh, so that's the exocrine function of the testicle. You have, then you have the endocrine function of the testicle. Uh, so LH acts on the Leydig cells to make testosterone, uh, which is converted into DHT, as we all know. Uh, and then uh, probably the most common reason men in the US have low testosterone is adipose tissue has lots of aromatase enzyme in it that uh, breaks down testosterone into estradiol, and it's estradiol that provides the negative feedback inhibition on both the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland for the endocrine aspect of the testicle. Uh, and so, um, you know, these really match up with um, the, uh, the sort of broad category of pre-testicular, testicular, and post-testicular uh, functions of the or causes for male infertility. Uh, if you recall back to your endocrinology classes uh, in med school, so primary hypogonadism refers to testicular dysfunction. Secondary is a step above that, so that's the pituitary gland. And then uh, post testicular, you're not going to have hormonal MONL. So uh, in this case, um, he has azospermia, uh, borderline low testosterone, but very high LH and FSH. 
the smallish testicles. And so um, high FSH, a little bit low testosterone, so he has a primary uh, testicular failure or primary hypogonadism. So um, one of the uh, key things to remember about differentiating an obstructive process from a non-obstructive process uh, in, in men who have azospermia, there's two things you look at, testicular size uh, and um, you know, whenever you see an ultrasound, they're always giving you these three dimensions. So, uh, so the testicular, the longest testicular axis and, and then the FSH uh, should be uh, less than 7.6 if it's an obstructive process. So um, uh, one way to kind of remember that is the F, it, you know, it's kind of like a reverse seven. Um, so just FSH, should be less than seven if everything is functioning well within the testicle from a sperm production standpoint. Uh, and then the 4.6 um, is just, a, I guess you just have to remember that number. So in this case, um, FSH obviously greater than uh, 7.6 and uh, the testicular volume is less than four. And so, um, so we know that this patient has uh, primary hypogonadism or non-obstructive azospermia. So um, Clomid, that increases LH and FSH. He already has pretty high uh, gonadotropins. HCG acts like LH. That's um, already pretty high. Uh, scrotal ultrasound, like I said, almost never the right answer. Uh, MRI to evaluate for a pituitary abnormality um, it doesn't, uh, his clinical picture isn't consistent with that because he's producing, if anything, more LH and FSH, not, uh, not less. And so uh, the correct answer for him is uh, a micro tessy. So what's the semen volume? And then what is the FSH and testicular volume? FSH should be less than seven if normal spermatogenesis is happening. And, uh, and then testicular volume is, is the other uh, key parameter. Uh, so next question. In a man with azospermia and elevated FSH, the best predictor of sperm retrieval from the testicle is what? So um, there's uh, plenty of studies that have looked at predictors for uh, a microtessy because on average, about 50% of the time we're able to find sperm. So it'd be nice if we, we could counsel patients a little bit better than a flip of a coin uh, about their chances of uh, finding sperm. Um, and uh, what this is getting at is really there aren't good predictors. So serum FSH uh, is not, uh, does not correlate. Even with someone who has very high FSH, you can still find sperm. Um, testosterone level um, similarly uh, doesn't predict. Uh, seminal volume and presence of the vas deferens. So these, you know, again, these are more post-testicular things. Like if you have a low semen volume, um, why would you have an elevated FSH? Elevated FSH is indicative of non-obstructive azospermia. And the presence of the vas deferens, again, um, in someone who has absence of the vas deferens, they have normal sperm production. So they're going to have normal FSH. So, so that's not relevant here. So the answer is a Y chromosome deletion subtype. Uh, and the reason for that is um, studies that have basically found that the retrieval rate with an AZF A or B or B and C deletion is zero. So really, when you're testing someone, when you're doing genetic testing on someone with non-obstructive azospermia, the reason you're doing that is because if, uh, if they have a C deletion, they have a above average chance of finding sperm. If they have an A or B, uh, then you don't even do a micro test. There's no point. So just remember that AZFC is the cool one to have.
Um, in terms of the genetic testing, so you know, if you go back to the to this question, it was a 35 year old man with azospermia, uh, high FSH, so we know it's non obstructive azospermia, and they make the point that normal genetic testing, uh, and so that's you know because that this patient did not have an AZF A or B deletion, that's why you could proceed with a micro testing. Um, and so if you look at the, the AUA uh, best practice statement, um, check a karyotype. You're primarily looking for Klein-Felter syndrome and check Y-chromosome microdeletion assay in men with non-obstructive azospermia or severe oligospermia, which is less than 5 million. Uh, and so again, that's why they mentioned that in that the stem of this question. Uh, along the lines of uh, genetic testing, so 35 year old man has primary infertility, uh, meaning that uh, he's never had children versus secondary, uh, which is someone who's had children, but uh, is currently having difficulties. On physical exam, neither vas deferens is palpable. Uh, so he's got congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. Each testis uh, is 34 milliliters in volume. So pretty good sized testicles. You could say that like uh, 18 milliliters is kind of a, a reasonable threshold for normal versus abnormal. Uh, semen analysis reveals 0 0.3 milliliters of volume. So like I said earlier, um, CBAVD, you're going to have low volume because they also have underdeveloped seminal vesicles. And so this is less than one milliliter. So he's got low volume. And he's got azospermia. Uh, the man and his wife would like to pursue all options for parenthood. Next step, scrotal ultrasound. Yet again, not the right answer. Um, why chromosome microdeletion analysis and karyotype? Well, he has azospermia, uh, so you know they're trying to get you to select that one. Um, but again, he has, um, they don't tell you the FSH, but the size of his testicles is normal. So uh, where even if they didn't mention the um, vows deference being um, absent, you're thinking an obstructive process because the volume of the testicles is normal. Um, and so uh, again, if you go back, this says, check these genetic tests in non-obstructive azospermia. And I don't think that this guy has that. Um, cystic fibrosis mutation analysis, that uh, is a reasonable option. Diagnostic testicular biopsy with scrotal exploration. So uh, we do diagnostic testis, testicular biopsies rarely, um, generally just with the testicular volume and the FSH, you're able to get a sense is someone azospermic because of um, a production problem or an obstructive problem. Uh, if there's uh, uncertainty, uh, then a diagnostic testicular biopsy is reasonable. In this patient, we, we know why he has azospermia. It's because he's, he doesn't have any vas deferens. So that's not the right answer. And then um, donor sperm IUI, um, that's, uh, I don't know, that, that's assuming he doesn't produce sperm, but again, is is testicular volume is, is quite high, so we we think he produces sperm. So, um, so that isn't the right answer. So, um, again, going back to the AUA best practice statement, uh, men with congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens um, should be offered genetic counseling and testing for cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator mutation. So um, basically, uh, we think that all men with um, CDABD, this is they're at, at least a carrier for 
a uh, mutation in the CF uh, gene. Um, pretty much all men with uh, cystic fibrosis, so like because it's an autosomal recessive condition, uh, so men with um, both uh, chromosomes with a mutation in the, in the CFTR gene, um, all of those men will have absence of the vas deferens. Um, but many men with uh, bilateral absence of the vas deferens will be at least carriers for CFTR mutations. So that's the right answer. Um, along the lines of uh, absence of the of a vas deferens. So this is a 32 year old uh, with infertility and unilateral absence of the vas deferens. 28 ml testes, that's greater than 18. So it's got a normal volume. So we're thinking uh, an obstructive process here. Semen analysis reveals a volume of 0 0.5 ml. Um, so again, that's less than one ml. So that's low. Uh, azospermia and a pH of 6.4. So that's acidic. So we suspect that he is missing his seminal vesicles because they produce uh, basic uh, fluid. His FSH is 4.9, that is less than seven. So again, that goes along with an obstructive process. Um, we do a truss, uh, presumably we did a um, post ejaculatory urine analysis that was normal. So we proceeded with a truss that reveals that he's missing uh, a seminal vesicle on one side and the other side uh, is hypoplastic, hence the, the low volume acidic um, sperm. Genetic testing is normal. The next step is uh, renal ultrasound, explore the uh, scrotum and do vasography scrotal ultrasound, a sweat test, or a testis biopsy. So um, this is getting at the correlation between uh, the, the embryologic association between uh, vasal formation and, uh, and renal formation. So, um, the correct answer on this one is a renal ultrasound. And that's because in, embryo, in embryology, so the, the mesonephric duct uh, is related to uh, the ureteric bud and the metanephric mass. And so um, oftentimes, uh, if someone has um, malformation of the vas deferens, it's uh, it'll be correlated with uh, an absence of the kidney on that same side. So um, they like to give, they like to test you on when do you do uh, genetic testing for cystic fibrosis versus, which is one condition associated with absence of the vas deferens versus um, a renal ultrasound to see if there is an embryologic abnormality, and that's the explanation for the absence of the vas deferens. So the order of those tests is dependent upon whether or not they have absence of the vas deferens on both sides versus one side. So in that first case, he was missing um, his vas deferens on both sides, congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens, and so we tested him for cystic fibrosis. That was, that was his test. Now, if that came back positive and it does an 80%, then we're done. We know that he uh, has both his kidneys because um, the absence of the vas deferens is due to uh, this genetic uh, mutation as opposed to an embryologic abnormality. But if the CFTR test is normal, then, and, and if you go back to the question, it says genetic testing is normal. See, they left it vague, but his testing was normal. 
uh, and um, and so the renal ultrasound would show uh, in up to 20% of men, uh, it would show a renal anomaly on, on one side. Now, if it's just one vas deferens that is absent, then you're much more likely to have a renal anomaly uh, for it to be an embryologic abnormality. So, so the first test in these men with the unilateral absence of the vas deferens is a renal ultrasound. Um, and if that renal ultrasound shows a renal anomaly, then again, you're done. You know that they just have a embryologic abnormality. If the guy with unilateral absence of the vas deferens has a normal ultrasound, then you can do the genetic testing and, and that'll um, be abnormal in about 20% of um, that. So, I'll zoom in on this in a second, but this is kind of the, the workup for azospermia. Uh, so you can see at the very top, the first question you want to ask is, is the semen volume low or is it normal? Because um, it's very different workups. So let's focus on the low. So low semen volume. The next thing you want to know is their exam. Do they have both vas deferens or are they missing both or one of their vas deferens? If they have both their vas deferens, then you're trying to figure out, are they um, retrograde ejaculating or are they uh, blocked at the ejaculatory duct? So first you do the post ejaculate urine analysis because that's the less invasive test. If they have a significant number of sperm in their post ejaculate urine analysis, then you're done. You diagnose them with retrograde ejaculation. And you can treat that with an electro ejaculation or um, an alpha agonist um, or a testicular sperm extraction. Uh, if they have both vas deferens, but their post ejaculatory urine analysis is negative, then do a truss plus or minus aspiration to try to diagnose ejaculatory duct obstruction. Again, low semen volume suggests that perhaps there's something wrong with their seminal vesicles. Um, so if they have, if they're missing both vas deferens, you're thinking they may be a carrier for cystic fibrosis. So test that. If it comes back normal, then get a renal ultrasound to see if they have a, a renal anomaly. Uh, one side of the vas deferens is missing. You're thinking this is more likely an embryologic abnormality. Uh, so get the renal ultrasound. If they're missing a kidney on that same side, you're done. Uh, if they have both kidneys, then you should test for cystic fibrosis. So moving on to the normal semen volume part of the workup. So um, this is where that uh, FSH and testicular volume are so important. So if they have atrophic testicles and they have very low FSH, generally I would say less than one uh, would be low FSH, uh, kind of just like the, the volume of semen. Um, so if FSH is less than one and they have atrophic testicles, that makes me think of a pre-testicular problem. So I wanna get an MRI to evaluate their pituitary gland. If they have high FSH and an atrophic testicle, uh, that makes me think of a primary testicular problem. Uh, and uh, in azospermia, that's non-obstructive azospermia. So we're gonna do the genetic testing to see if they have Klinefelters and to see uh, if they have an um, Y chromosome microdeletion. If, um, if it's an A or B, then they need to adopt or get donor sperm. Uh, if they don't have an A or B deletion, then you can proceed with microtessie. Now, um, I don't know if they would ask you this 
but it, it is in the guidelines. So, and it's someone with normal volume, uh, semen, uh, and equivocal FSH and testicular volume. Like let's say their FSH is um, say six uh, and their testicular uh, volume is say like the axis is uh, five. You know, that's, uh, that could be obstructive or it could be non-obstructive. You don't really know. Um, and let's, you know, typically you would have done a, um, uh, a trust uh, to see if there is like a partial ejaculatory duct obstruction. Um, but really, I think what they would test you on is, is this. If someone has a normal semen volume, uh, normal FSH, normal testis volume, that's pretty much the only time a diagnostic testis biopsy is indicated. And really what you're trying to figure out is, um, do they have completely normal sperm production? Uh, in which case they likely are obstructed, you know, somewhere perhaps in the epididymis and they need a vasoepididymostomy, um, or they have like a discrete uh, area of vasal atresia that you didn't pick up on exam. Um, versus something called maturation arrest, which is basically where they have uh, spermatogenesis is progressing through uh, most of the early stages of spermatogenesis, but late in the development of sperm, uh, the, their, their development is arresting. And so they have no uh, mature sperm coming out in their ejaculate. Um, and that's why they have normal volume testicles because they their testicles are full of the precursors to sperm. Uh, and that's why they have uh, a normal FSH because um, you know their Sertoli cells don't sense that um, that's, there's a problem with spermatogenesis. So, um, that testis biopsy, you would see maturation arrest, which is uh, a form of non-obstructive vasospermia. And so you could do a micro tessie to try to find uh, those areas of the testicle where a few sperm are kind of breaking through the, that maturation arrest. And you can use that with IVF and ICSI. So moving on. Um, 31-year-old man desires a kid. Physical exam is normal with 30 ml testes, some normal volume testicles. So that's suggestive of uh, an obstructive process. Uh, he's azospermic, has a semen volume of 3.5 ml, so normal volume, and pH is basic. So we're not thinking ejaculatory duct obstruction. Uh, we think his, um, uh, we think his, some of the vesicles are intact as well. His FSH is 3.6, so that's less than seven. So um, that is suggestive of, um, of obstruction. Um, so let's see. So he's got azospermia, normal. So first step, normal volume. Um, but normal volume testicles and normal FSH. So, um, so that, if you go back to here, so that's this uh, situation that I was just talking about. Um, Clomiphene citrate, uh, not really indicated here because his, um, we don't really know what his testosterone level is. Uh, Semo fructose level, I mean, we know his pH is basic, so we know his seminal vesicles are, are working fine. Post-ejaculate urine analysis, again, normal volume uh, semen, and so he's not retrograde ejaculating. Uh, a truss um, that, uh, you know, in real life, that might be a, reason, a reasonable next step, but not according to the guidelines. What they're going for is that you want to do a testicular biopsy with a sperm uh, with sperm retrieval, uh, because again his exam was normal, right? It's not like he was you could feel any uh, level of obstruction. So 
um, you're going to do a, a diagnostic testicular biopsy. And practically speaking, if you're doing a biopsy, um, you know, you're, you can evaluate for a reconstruction, but while you're doing the biopsy, you might as well just send some to the bank, some tissue to the bank so that um, they uh, could use that with IVF and ICSI as well. Um, moving on into the realm of reconstruction. So a 39-year-old man, a large left varicocele, wants a vasectomy reversal. Um, at exploration, he has rare non-motile sperm on the right vas deferens and absence of sperm in the clear fluid from uh, the left vas deferens. Next step, bilateral VV, treat his varicocele and do a VV, uh, do a VV on the right or and a left VV. Uh, do a testis biopsy and see what's going on in that left testicle. Is it, is it not producing sperm because of his large varicocele uh, or just do a testicular sperm extraction? So after a vasectomy, so yeah, I'm sure we all know you're removing a segment of the vas deferens, right? So you can either, uh, when you're doing a reconstruction, you can either just plug everything back up uh, and do a vasovasostomy uh, that has a higher success rate. Um, so that's one option. Now, uh, in the in the vasectomy reversal, what you're going to do is basically cut off the say the tie or the clip on the testicular end of the vas deferens to see is there sperm coming out of that that vas deferens. Now, why might there be no sperm coming out? Well, the longer the duration of obstruction, you can think of it like uh, the, the greater the likelihood that there can be some inflammation uh, along the vas deferens or the epididymis. And if you have inflammation, uh, let's say here in the body of the epididymis, uh, that can cause scar tissue and as a result, uh, the sperm that are coming out into the head of the epididymis only make it down to the body of the epididymis and they don't go into the vas deferens. So, um, so if you cut off the, the clip on the testicular end of the vas deferens and you don't see sperm, uh, you might be thinking that they have an obstruction on uh, a secondary obstruction in the epididymis, in which case, you would need to do a vasoepididymostomy uh, to, to sort of hook up the abdominal vas deferens proximal to the secondary obstruction. So that's what they're uh, getting at with this question. Now, um, so they say he's got rare non motile sperm on the right side and absence of sperm in clear fluid from the left vas deferens. So, um, so when you're doing a vasectomy reversal, uh, so this is this is the algorithm that you're gonna walk through. So one, is there any fluid coming out of that vas deferens when you, uh, when you cut off the clip on the testicular side? Um, if there is no fluid coming out, then you're going to do a vasoepididymostomy. If there is fluid and it's very clear, then uh, you can also do a vasopasostomy because uh, that clear fluid will likely have a return of sperm to it. And so that's why you can do a vasopasostomy. But if it is very opaque, uh, then that's when you need to consider that you, you basically have had, uh, imagine a segment of the vas, de vas deferens and epididymis where there's been no sort of transit of sperm through it. It's just been sitting there um, uh, collecting uh, inflammatory cells. So that's where you, you need to uh, base your decision on whether or not there is sperm present or absent. Obviously, if there's sperm in that fluid, you do a VV because 
um, there, you know, if there's sperm present in the testicular end of the mass deferens, obviously they made it there recently. But if there's opaque fluid with no sperm, that's when you do a VE. Uh, so, so back to the question. So, so let's see. So um, the right side has sperm. So we're doing, we're going to do a vasovasostomy on that side. And the left side has no sperm, but is clear fluid. Uh, so this fluid is clear. So we're going to do a VV on the left side as well. So it's either this answer or left varicocelectomy and bilateral VV. Now, um, you know, we know that varicocele has a negative impact on sperm production. And we're trying to uh, optimize his uh, chances at fertility as much as possible. So, you know, why not do a varicocelectomy at the same time? And ultimately what that is getting at is, um, you know, when you do a varicocelectomy, you're ligating the pampiniform plexus uh, because those are abnormal and refluxing. And so you're relying on the vasal veins to kind of pick up the slack of the outflow of blood from the testicle. And this guy, you he had a vasectomy and you're about to um, be reconstructing the vas deferens. And so um, what that is getting at is you could have a situation where um, you have some uh, insufficiency of venous outflow from the testicle if you both ligate the varicocele veins uh, and do work on his vas deferens. So, so that's why the uh, correct answer here was a vasovasostomy. Um, okay, so moving on. 43-year-old man wants a kid and his wife is 38. Both testes are five centimeters and longitudinal axis. So, um, so those are uh, greater than 4.6. So um, we're thinking he has um, normal sperm production and they're firm on physical exam. So again, that um, uh, if you recall one of the earlier questions, they commented on the softness of the testicles. And so soft is reflective of um, uh, insufficient sperm production. Firm would be um, normal sperm production. He has two semen analyses that show azospermia with volumes of 2.1 and 2.3. So this is normal volume uh, azospermia. The FSH is 2.8. So the FSH is less than seven. So that goes along with a obstructive process. So, so again, this guy has um, normal volume semen uh, and uh, normal size testicle, normal, um, normal FSH. Next step, adoption, um, and it seems presumptuous. Uh, Truss, so he, he has normal volumes. Um, so um, I'm not sure that's the right answer. Um, evaluation of the wife is reasonable. She's 38. Testicular sperm extraction with ICSI. Um, he's, he's got azospermia, so that could be it, but it's not non-obstructive azospermia. Microsurgical scrotal ductal reconstruction. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that's assuming, I, I think that's a reasonable option. He, he may be obstructed. Uh, I would probably do a testis biopsy initially. And so really what this question is, is kind of wanting you to focus on is that his wife has uh, advanced maternal age or is over 35. And so, um, you know, you always have to be mindful that you are 
uh, treating a couple, you're not just treating the man. And many of the interventions that we do on the man take time to, um, to see a benefit. So for example, a varicocelectomy, um, you know, it's gonna be at least three months, if not six months before you see improvements in the sperm count. And, um, and they, the, the partner may not have so much time uh, from an ovarian reserve standpoint. And so, um, you know, if you look at uh, the guidelines for um, treating a varicocele, uh, you can treat it in someone who has an abnormal sperm count or an abnormal motility and a clinical varicocele that is palpable on exam, not just detected on ultrasound. Uh, and there are no uh, female factors. Uh, and so um, if you were to, like, if this were, uh, if this were uh, someone with a varicocele, um, that probably treating that varicocele wouldn't be the right answer, again, because of the female age, you have to uh, evaluate her wife first. Um, so, so yeah, so are there any female factors? Because again, that will um, largely guide your treatment options. Um, all right, so this is, I think the last case. Um, 28 year old man with Kalman syndrome was treated with HCG and FSH injections over two years. So Kalman syndrome, uh, so that is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So they're missing, uh, or they, they can't produce uh, LH and FSH. So what did we do? We replaced the LH with HCG that caused the testicles to produce testosterone. Um, so we've got the testicles producing a good amount of testosterone and then they can't produce FSH. So we gave them FSH to stimulate sperm production. And we did that over two years. His serum testosterone and FSH levels are normal. So we did a good, we did a good job in terms of um, uh, basically replacing his uh, hormone, his HPG axis, or at least his PG axis. Um, his semen volume is one, so borderline low. Um, Sperm count is 6 million per milliliter. That's also low. He's got good motility though. His motility is 90%. Uh, timed intercourse has not resulted in pregnancy for his wife, um, whose evaluation is normal. So that's, uh, so that's key. Next step. So IUI, uh, ultrasound, again, uh, is, it's just never the right answer. Um, ICSI, um, trust or a testis biopsy. So, um, so this guy had Kalman syndrome. So let's see, so a low volume, um, you know, we're, we're skipping a post ejaculate urine analysis to go straight to trust. But um, really, what this is is kind of testing you, it's, it's kind of putting in together a lot of concepts. So Kalman syndrome, so basically uh, for this guy's whole life, he didn't have testosterone. So we know that prostate and seminal vesicles are, um, are sensitive to testosterone. And so, um, you know, what are the, what are the cause, what are the reasons why he has borderline low volume? Do we think he coincidentally also has an ejaculatory duct obstruction? You know, probably not. Does he have any reason to have retrograde ejaculation? Uh, no. So um, again, you, you look back at the reason someone could have a low volume semen, it's low testosterone. And, and in Kalman syndrome, they, you know, they've uh, gone their whole lives with um, low testosterone. So uh, this is getting at the fact that he has um, probably a hypoplastic uh, uh, prostate and seminal vesicle, and that's why 
the semen volume is low. Um, and so uh, when we're, by replacing his FSH and LH, we, we brought that testosterone up to normal, but it's not going to be, um, you know, it's not going to like cause the prostate to all of a sudden become a normal volume. So, so that, uh, that's why he's got borderline low volume. Uh, and so really what this question is getting at then is um, they want you to decide uh, between IUI and ICSI. Uh, and, um, and you can kind of get that sense because so the volume was one milliliter, the sperm count was six million, so pretty decent, and the motility was pretty good too. Um, and so, you know, it's been two years uh, and timed intercourse has not resulted in pregnancy. So at that point, it is reasonable for a couple to move forward with some form of assisted reproductive technology. Um, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So you, that's with IVF. Um, you know, why, again, you, if you're able to do something less invasive in general on an exam, you'd like to do the less invasive option. And obviously intrauterine insemination is less invasive, but this is, you know, they're kind of um, wanting you to know that uh, a good rule of thumb in terms of if a man has enough sperm to do intrauterine insemination versus needing to do I IVF, uh, is does the man have a total of 5 million motile sperm? So that's multiplying the volume, uh, which uh, luckily is 1.0 in this question. Uh, so the volume times the sperm count times the motility. Um, so, you know, one times six times 0.9. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's greater than five. So, um, so that's the answer here. Um, so um, I'm almost out of time, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, you can always email me questions. Um, but yeah, so those are the, the kind of broad uh, things to be mindful of when, uh, when you're thinking of these infertility questions. So one, Try to, try to fit them into a framework of, uh, is it a pre-testicular problem that, you know, some problem with their pituitary gland uh, or a testicular problem like varicocele, um, or is it a, a post-testicular problem where they are obstructive? So try to fit them into that framework. And then um, the, the sort of first thing I look at is, what is their semen volume? because uh, that'll largely guide uh, my thinking as to, um, you know, particularly the azoospermic patients, um, is it kind of a, a post-testicular problem versus a testicular problem? Um, and then um, the FSH and testicular volume, those, you know, those are very good clues as to what the underlying etiology is. Uh, and then lastly, keep in mind uh, female factors, including uh, the indications for different types of assisted reproductive technology. So thank you for your attention. And like I said, I'm happy to take any questions or, or you can always email me. No, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Najari. I can, I can tell you, I mean, you know, when you're right, when you have, you know, these types of situations where they give you uh, these values, whether it's sperm count, testicular size, semen volume, and the numbers are below or above, you know, finding a way to, you know, put all that information together. I think your algorithms were, are going to be super high yield um, to be able to kind of organize that. It's, it's a problem that I have trying to figure that stuff out. Um, and your, the, the algorithms you provided have been, were just uh, amazing. So thank you. Um, there doesn't look to be any questions right now, but hopefully if anyone does have any questions out there, whoever watches this video later, please uh, feel free to email us or Dr. Najari. Um, just one plug for everyone. Um, 
you know, if you've enjoyed this in-service prep series, just, you know, there's going to be a survey that goes out pretty soon. Tell us what we can do better. Tell us what we have done well. And uh, we look forward to continuing to provide and getting great speakers like you, um, Dr. Najari, to help us.